as we can, to come forward and read a Second Timothy one, which will form our introduction to our brother Mark's words this morning. Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I came to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I have persuaded thee in thee also. Therefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, whom hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For, the call, for which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which is I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus, that the good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Spirit which dwelleth in us, this thou knowest, that all which are in Asia are turned away from me, of whom is Phagellus and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Anisiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day, and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Almighty God, Yahweh, the strength of the powerful ones of Israel, we come into thy glorious presence, our loving Father, to thank thee for thy word for this privilege of joining together around thy word and the table of memorials this day. And Father, we thank thee for the promise thou hast given. We praise and honour thee for thou art worthy and hast created this earth and by thy power and might all life is sustained. And we thank thee for the evidence of thy hand at work in the world and the nations about us. And we long, O God, for the coming of thy Son. We pray for that kingdom to come soon, that he might establish that kingdom of glory, that the violence and the wickedness so evident about this earth will give way to peace and justice and righteousness, thy will done throughout the whole earth. And as we look for that day, Father, we pray for thy people Israel, for we know they yet walk in darkness and the pride and strength of their own hand. And yet they are thy people and thou hast declared that thy throne will be established in Jerusalem. And we look upon a world that is 
rising in its hatred and opposition to thy people and we know that thy judgments will come upon them. And so we pray for the strength, Father, to boldly and strongly and faithfully hold on and declare the wondrous hope of Israel that has brought us, bound us together, the hope of the coming of thy kingdom and the fulfilment of the promise and covenant thou did make with Abraham. And so we pray, loving God, that as we consider thy word together this day, we might be moved to contemplate our position before thee. We might confess our sins and acknowledge, Father, that thou art truly a gracious and merciful God who does extend unto us thy mercy. And we are humbled by the knowledge that thou, who sitteth above the circle of the whole universe, that thou, O God, dost know us each one, and that thou dost concern thyself with us each one. And thou dost not wish that any should perish, but that all might come unto salvation through thy Son. So we thank thee for his sacrifice, for his life, his death, and his resurrection, and his manifestation of thy glory. And so we do pray, loving God, for thy blessing upon our brethren who lead us in this meeting. And we pray especially for our brother who shall open thy word and exhort us that we might be moved by the power of that word to go forth renewed in the vigour of our faith, strengthened in our hope, and earnestly striving to please thee and to help others on the way. And Father, we know that many of thy servants throughout this earth who serve in very difficult and dangerous situations, and we pray for them. We pray for those who mourn. We pray for those, Father, who are laid aside by the infirmities of the body, that thy strength and help will be with them. And we pray for those, Father, who uh, are threatened by the events of life that come upon them, by the wickedness of men about them, and by the threats of fires and storms and earthquakes and all of those things. And we plead, loving God, that thou wilt gather them into the safety of thine encircling arms. And so we pray that, as an ecclesia, thy people gathered throughout this whole earth might hold aloft that wondrous light of truth, that we might shine forth in this dark and degenerate age, not influenced farther by the by the evils of the minds of men that so influence all that is done in the world this day that we might hold aloft the light of truth and stand separate from those things to show forth our commitment unto thee. So loving God, wilt thou hear our prayer? Wilt thou accept the thanks and the praises and the pleadings that we lay before thee through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
have some words of um, encouragement and exhortation. And this morning we'll invite Brother Mark Dennis to come forward and, and give us that. Thank you, Brother David. Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. We're going to concentrate uh, mainly this morning on just one verse um, from Second Timothy chapter 1 that we've just read, uh, from verse 7, and even in particular just concentrating on just those last few words where Paul makes a comment about a sound mind. Before we do that, before we think about the sound mind that uh, Paul is exhorting Timothy and uh, by extension us to, let's just spend a minute or two thinking about the unsound mind that so easily develops in today's world. Today's world is extremely good at producing unsound minds. It doesn't matter where we look in society, we see a society that is geared towards undermining the soundness of minds. In a country like Australia where most diseases are being reduced in severity and complexity because of the advances in medical science and application, mental health problems continue to rise unabated. In 2017 and 18, the, uh, a national health survey was done in Australia and uh, they collated the statistics and put it together to produce what they called a typical Australian, that is collating all the all the statistics and, and creating one person who might be seen to be a typical Australian. And the typical Australian, according to this uh, survey, was, is a non-smoker who has never smoked, does 42 minutes of exercise every day, is overweight or obese, and does not eat enough vegetables. And then it lists the, at least some of the, uh, the diseases that um, the typical Australian would have and uh, by far um, in advance of any of the other chronic diseases that the typical Australian might suffer from, mental health problems are miles in front of the second place getter which is a physical problem, back problems. So some 4.8 million Australians <coughs> suffer from mental health or a chronic mental health condition. So when thinking about today's reading from 2 Timothy chapter 1, that little phrase that Paul uses at the end of verse 7 really leapt out to me when I was looking at this. A sound mind, he talks about. What does Paul mean by this? Does, why does he choose to instruct Timothy and, of course, us about this? A sound mind. And how can we achieve this goal of a sound mind that he's talking about? As we said a moment ago, our society, our culture is, is steeped in ways to develop an unsound mind in purely a mental health context. Brother Rick Steele recently um, did a talk uh, on a Sunday afternoon about one aspect of this in relation to uh, screen time, social media and so on, particularly on young minds, on, the, on our teenage um, population. How that modern technology has the ability to methodically alter the brains of young and old alike. And I mentioned to Brother Rick afterwards that we just recently, or about six months ago now, listened to a very interesting ABC podcast by uh, David Gillespie that might be known uh, by some of you. He's done quite a bit of, uh, uh, quite a few of those uh, types of things and he he did a, a, an ABC podcast called How the iPhone Rewrote the Teenage Brain. And it's, if you have any interest in the subject, it's, uh, a, it's a very interesting uh, thing to listen to. But there are many other ways that society does produce this so-called unsound mind. There are some occupations, particularly those that have direct involvement with, um, with trauma, can produce large numbers of people who have mentally unsound minds. And an example of this came to mind for me recently. I just had a patient in a, a week or two ago. He's, he has a son who serves in the military. He's uh, in the army and he's been serving in Afghanistan. And I asked him 
how his son was going. He said, oh, he's just returned home from, from his active service there. I said, how is he? And his answer was a mess because of the trauma uh, that he has suffered. And, and that's just typical of uh, that occupation and many others that can involve direct trauma to produce an unsound mind. We have lots of other opportunities to produce unsound minds, the sort of entertainment that the world offers, the social attitude to moral issues, things that we have grappled with in this country, the, the uh, debate over same-sex marriage, of course, the attitude of the Australian population generally has changed on that over recent years, recent decades, because of course, the society that dictates the social norms and hence has uh, brought about a change in law, the society itself has changed because it is unstable. It is unsound in that sense because it is not founded on God's principles. And so it's not surprising that the outflow of this unstable society in that sense is one that messes with our minds. But what exactly is Paul talking about here in 2 Timothy chapter 1? Is he just talking about mental health as we've, as, as we've been uh, speaking about over the last minute or two? Or is he driving at something deeper? Well, a good place to start, of course, is to have a look at the word that he uses for un, uh, a sound mind. It's a, it's a Greek word, sophrenismos. But it's a, it's a once-a, it's only used once in the Bible. And so uh, we don't get a lot of other context to sort of work out exactly what he means by that because it's only used here in 2 Timothy chapter 1. But other translations translate it in this way. They, some uh, have it as self-control, self-discipline, discipline, or good or sound judgment. That seems to be the idea behind what Paul has in mind here. The other way that we can get a little bit of an insight also is to think about the context. Where is Paul? What is he doing when he's writing this epistle to Timothy in 2 Timothy? Well, of course, he's in, he's in Rome and he is in prison in Rome. And he's, he knows that his life is coming to an end. He's probably in the, uh, in the Mamertine prison, which is just in Rome, just near the... Uh, near the Roman Forum, it can be visited today, and it is a very, uh, a very moving uh, thing to do that, to realise that uh, you may be in the very spot where Paul was here and writing this epistle. Now, he knew that his time was nearly done, and that here he is languishing in this cold dungeon, as is hinted in chapter 4, verse 13, where he, he, he asks, could I please have my cloak? In other words, it's cold, it's dank here. But more importantly, he wants those things for spiritual nourishment and guidance. But I wonder under such, such circumstances, brothers and sisters, whether, whether we would have the sophrinismos that Paul talks about here, that Paul clearly has, that self-control, that self-discipline, that good and sound judgment, that sound mind. Would we have that same attitude that Paul was able to exhibit here? As we know, an impending disaster or death, as the saying is, it tends to wonderfully focus the mind. And it certainly did that for Paul. But Paul, rather than wallowing in self-pity or, or, or something similar, Paul was outward looking. He was very little concerned for his own comfort. Yes, he wanted, he wanted something to try and keep him warm. But he was more concerned with the spiritual welfare of the ecclesia. And Paul certainly had developed that sound mind that he now exhorts Timothy and us to have. If anyone had reason to fear, as it speaks about, as he talks about there earlier in that verse, he says, God has not given us the spirit of fear. If anyone had reason to fear, Paul did at that time. But he didn't let, thing, uh, didn't let fear be the thing that drove him. Despite the fact that he was in prison with imminent death, 
he felt empowered. Despite the fact that he was being unjustly treated by the Roman authorities and his brothers and sisters, he exuded love, which he also speaks about there in verse 7. And because he had put down that fear and, that, and because he truly loved, it resulted in him being able to develop that sound mind that he exhorts us about here. Let's just go back and have a look at those elements that he mentions there in verse 7. First of all, fear. He says, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Now, I remember uh, Brother Jared Edgecombe uh, gave us some talks on this subject of fear a year or two back, maybe it's a little longer. And in terms of developing a spiritually sound mind that Paul wants us to have, Eliminating fear is a major component. We all know that fear is so debilitating. And a sound mind is one that is not overly concerned with present cares and problems of, the lo of, of this life. A sound mind is one that is not concerned for what the future may hold in a physical sense, as Paul knew his impending death. But a sound mind is one that can see beyond these things and concerns. Just come back with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 12 for a moment, just to have a, an illustration of this, this point. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, and we'll start at verse 28 well-known words of the Lord Jesus. If then God so clothe the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? Well, here's a bit of a link to what Paul was talking about. Paul was worried about an item of clothing because of his personal discomfort, but not overly worried about it, as Jesus exhorts here. And seek not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye doubt of doubtful mind, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. <clears throat> Fear not, little flock, he says. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So there's one of the keys for us, isn't it, to developing a sound mind. Not to be overly concerned about things that might uh, be weighing us down now or even things that we might foresee for the future. If we can look beyond those things and stay focused on the things that are way beyond and way more important, and indeed, uh, as Brother Dave's um, <coughs> introductory comments from Romans 8 uh, highlighted, that the things that are ahead are so much better and, uh, than the things that we have to be concerned about now. In fact, I hadn't spoken to Brother Dave about that, but they were going to be my closing uh, uh, verses, but uh, we'll work around that. Um, but here, uh, here the Lord Jesus says, Fear not, little flock. And it is this elimination of fear that is such an important basis or um, foundation for developing that sound mind that, uh, that Paul is talking about. And Timothy was a naturally fearful person. He was somewhat timid. We, we sort of gather that from the way that Paul writes to him. And we're often like that, aren't we, brothers and sisters, in our spiritual outlook. I mean, we might, be, uh, might not be naturally timid in our, in our uh, normal character, but we're often quite timid in our spiritual outlook. We can be fearful that we don't meet with God's approval. Fearful that because we constantly fall in the same sins that that's going to exclude us from God's kingdom. Fearful of believing that God's mercy will cover our sins. There are so many ways that we can be fearful, but we ought not to be. Let's come back to First Timothy, uh, sorry, Second Timothy. Chapter 1. We see that Paul gently encourages Timothy not to be fearful there in verse 7. 
Because in the previous verse, in verse 6, he has said, he, he tells him to stir up the gift of God. Another translation for that is to fan into flames the gift of God that you have received. We read about this, uh, if we just turn back a page or two, back to chapter 4 and verse 14. He says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 verse 14, ne Neglect not the gift that is in thee which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery and meditate <coughs> upon these things and give thyself wholly to them that thy, thy profiting may appear to all. In other words, Paul is telling Timothy and us by extension that we need to lift ourselves out of our spiritual fear, perhaps lift ourselves out of our natural comfort zones in our spiritual lives because Timothy was somewhat reluctant to do that. He was, he was reluctant to extend himself. He was reluctant to really fan into flames that gift that he had received. We need to exercise ourselves in our service and to really believe that God will save us. I think that's a very, very important part of developing that sound mind uh, that Paul is talking to us about here. Come across now back uh, to 2 Timothy, this time a couple of pages on, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 17 and 18. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. There was confidence. There was a sound mind. There was a mind that believed that God could and had forgiven him for all those sins. And Paul, as he expresses elsewhere, he was a sinner above all men. <coughs> the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory for ever and ever Paul had that confidence he had that sound mind that had elevated him beyond that fear of the present fear of the things that were encroaching upon him and he was confident for that ultimate future So back in chapter 1 and verse 7, we come to that next point, that, or the next uh, expression that Paul uses there. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. Well, that's a commonly used word in the, in, in the New Testament, uh, dynamis. The, the, you know, the, we're familiar with that concept in its English extension. <clears throat> that word's frequently used in association with with exercising Holy Spirit power, the power of the Holy Spirit gifts, but it's also used in the context of the power of the gospel and the preaching and the spoken word of God. For example, we don't need to turn to it, Romans chapter 1 verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Same word. And Timothy, who had received the laying on of hands and had the power of God's Holy Spirit gifts residing in him, was still somewhat reluctant to exercise that power, pardon me, <clears throat> that power, which is what Paul is exhorting him to do here. You know, there's no record, as far as I'm aware, no record of Timothy ever performing uh, any miracle at all, and yet he did have that laying on of hands from the Apostle Paul. We'd already read that uh, verse, uh, verse 14 of 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16, uh, sorry, verse 14 and 15 where Paul encourages Timothy to exercise that gift that he had received. And he goes on in verse 16 in that chapter and says take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine continue in them and for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee how's our exercising 
of the power of God going in us, brothers and sisters? Do we, as Paul says there in 2 Timothy 1, do we, oh, sorry, in uh, uh, 1 Timothy 4, do we meditate on it? Do we give ourselves wholly to it in such a way that others are going to profit from it as well as ourselves? Again, verse 16, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. And note that you know, we tend to, when we read that word doctrine, we tend to think of it as just a, a series of teachings. But in fact, when you trace that word through the New Testament, the doctrine of which he speaks about is very much more aligned with, well, it is aligned with teaching, but very much with practice as well. It's all about practice. It's all about behaviour. So how are we going with the elimination of that fear of the present? Fear of those things that take, uh, take precedent in our lives oftentimes. How are we going with the exercising of that power that we have received? Because, as Paul tells Timothy, it'll save others as well as save yourself. And then the next element that Paul talks about in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 is of love. Love. An essential quality for all of us, isn't it, brothers and sisters? The word that we're well familiar with, agape. The outward looking of our lives, the outward looking aspect where we look towards the needs and the benefit of others. And that is increasingly difficult, isn't it, brothers and sisters, in our egocentric world. A world that is focused upon us. Where all of our news sources are often all about what uh, about us, things that are important to us. Our egocentric world is not an outward looking world. Because even if we can eliminate that unfounded fear that, are, that, uh, that erodes our confidence in the salvation that God has effected, and if we allow the, 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 the power of the gospel to affect our lives in a real and meaningful way, well, then we will cease to be self-focused and we will look to exhibit God's love to all around us as the Apostle Paul did. And when all of those things work together there that he talks about here in verse 7, they will give us that sound mind that, talk, that Paul is talking about here. But what does that sound mind look in reality? What does it look like, I should say, in, in real life? Well, let me give you an example from the Epistle of Titus. Just come across a few pages to Titus chapter 2. And here, Paul uses a word that's not the same as that word that we've been looking at in uh, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, because we said it's a once-off, that's sophrenomos. Uh, word, but here we have a very closely uh, aligned word to that, and he talks about in uh, uh, verse one. He says, "But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine," and sound doctrine is about behaviour. That word for sound there is actually the, the the English extension is the word hygienic. Uh, so hygienic doctrine, hygienic behaviour. And then he goes on then to uh, use that, that same, uh, th those, those concepts there in verses 2 to 6. That the aged men be sober, grave and temperate. It's that same word. Sound in faith, uh, sorry, sound in faith, in love, <coughs> in patience. Verse 4. The women may teach the younger women to be sober. It's that same word word, that hygienic word that we're familiar with in English. Verse 5, to be discreet, chaste. Verse 6, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. 
So it's not the same word as uh, Paul has used in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, but it's a very, very closely aligned one. So when we read of a list of things like that in, in, in Titus, we get an idea of what Paul has in mind. It's all about behaviour, and it's about behaviour that is driven not by fear, but it's driven by the power of God's saving gospel residing in us, that power which energise us, energises us to, to uh, look outwards, to love one another, and to look to the needs of one another, and so to behave in a way that, um, that comes as a result of all of that. Similar concept, and we haven't got time to go into it now, but a similar concept, one of my favourite verses from the Old Testament in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, where Micah is grappling out loud, it's as though he's thinking out loud and expressing these thoughts and he says, what does God require of us but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Now that term, to do justly, means to make right judgment, which is almost exactly the same as the expression that Paul is using here in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, a sound mind, a mind that makes right judgment. In a, in a spiritual sense, of course, he's talking about. Let's come back to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we get another sort of little practical insight of what Paul might be wanting us to understand from this concept of a sound mind that we've been looking at this morning. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed. It's that, that word metamor metamorphosis. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So here we get an insight into how that sound mind can come about. It's not something that just happens by accident. It's not something that will develop on its own and stay sound and healthy. It requires constant renewal that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's an active process, brothers and sisters. A sound mind's not something that we're just born with and it's not something that will <coughs> stay with us without any effort on our part. Our world is very good at producing unsound minds and in fact James talks about and we'll just come across very briefly there to the book of James. James talks about this idea of an unsound mind doesn't he? Um, in chapter 1 and verse 8. You might not have quite thought of it like this but in James chapter 1 and verse 8 he says he really describes the epitome of what an unsound mind is. He says in James chapter, he's, he's developed his argument, he comes to verse 8 and he says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man. And that's what we can tend to be as no brothers and sisters. We're a little bit like how George Orwell described it in that in, in his novel called 1984, which when I studied it at school was still a long way into the future, but of course now is a long way in the past. But he talked about that double thing, or the expression that they used there was double thing. Double mindedness, which is what James is talking about here, and that is the idea, it, it, it's being able to hold two contradictory thoughts at the same time and to believe them both. That seems bizarre, doesn't it? But that's what James is talking about, and that's what we tend to do, brothers and sisters. We hold two contradictory thoughts at the same time, believing them both. And we all know of examples of that in our own lives. So how's our development of our singular mind, our stable mind, our sound mind? How are we going at eliminating that double-mindedness in our lives? How are we going at eliminating the fear that undermines that sound mind? Are we exercising the power of the gospel in our lives? 
and showing that to those around us because it will save both ourselves and others if we can do that. And is that power that resides in us producing the love, the outward looking care that should flow as a natural consequence? Well, Paul gives us a beautiful summary of how these things all work together to produce the sound mind that is so central to our spiritual well-being. And this will be our last uh, passage that we'll look at, Philippians, in, uh, sorry, penultimate passage, two passages from Philippians. First of all, Philippians chapter 4. Let's come back to that. Philippians chapter 4 and verses 4 to 8. Rejoice, he says. Rejoice in the Lord always. Well, we can't rejoice if we're fearful, can we, brothers and sisters? Rejoicing and fear simply can't go together. And again, he says, rejoice. <clears throat> Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. In other words, don't be overly anxious about those present things, as Paul was able to eliminate that anxiousness in his own life. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God. Well, that gives us an idea of what a sound mind looks like. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to list some of those attributes that give us that peace of God, that keep our hearts and minds sound. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So it's all bound up with having that sound mind that Paul exhorts us and Timothy to there in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Well, of course, as we come now to remember the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, as always, our Lord showed us the perfect example of what we have been exploring this morning. And just turn back a page to Philippians chapter 2, and we see how that in our Lord Jesus, whose emblems are uh, represented on the table before us, how he brings us all of this together in such a beautiful way. In verse 2 of Philippians chapter 2, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. Like-minded. Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Well, that's talking about that love of which um, Paul spoke in verse 7 of 2 Timothy 1. Look not every man on his own things, but also on the things of others. Exactly the same. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Let this sound mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And we know of the, the life and the example and the character of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had that sound mind, who was able to eliminate the fear of the crucifixion that was coming upon him. He set his face steadfastly to go towards Jerusalem when he knew what was coming upon him. He showed that love right up until the last moment, even while he was on the cross. He showed that love that was outward looking to the needs of others. He exhibited that power in his life. He had that perfect example of that sound mind. Verse 9, wherefore, because he was able to develop that sound mind, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And so now we look to Jesus who has been highly exalted, as, as uh, Paul says there, who had eliminated that fear, who had that power over his own mind, not my will but thine be done, who showed that love when he was hanging on the cross and so he became that ultimate example of that sound mind, a mind that was fully attuned to his father's and a mind which has brought about 
the salvation that we now come to remember. Brother Mark has fittingly brought us to the emblems this morning. And this morning, before we take the emblems, we'll have an introductory reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'll read this for you from verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, also he took the cup. And he had supped, saying, This cup is a new testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so this morning we'll come to do likewise. Let us give thanks now for the bread. Our loving Heavenly Father, the one who dwells above, who no man has seen or can see. We humbly come into your presence, knowing, dear God, that you hear our prayer. And for this, as your dear children, we are thankful. Dear God, we live in a world of chaos, but yet you have not forgotten us in our sins. You have not left, left us undone. But through your great love, that great sacrifice, a sacrifice where you lay down your only begotten Son. So we may have a hope, we may have a way whereby we can come unto you, not only to call you our Father, but to have the forgiveness of sins, an opportunity to be part of a glorious kingdom soon to come. And dear God, as we, your dear children, sit today, and reminded of that great sacrifice, reminded of how far we fall short of that calling which we are called. And as we strive to walk before you, as we endeavour to do those things which are right, we know, dear God, we fail. But today we ask that you accept our petitions, you forgive us for the sins that we do, and encourage us and help us as we strive to be more like you and your son. We love you for this, knowing you, God, you always love and care for us. And today, as we remember that great sacrifice, we are moved, we are touched. We ask, but we ask today that you accept our prayer, as we give you thanks for this, and pray through your Son, that we come to remember our Lord Jesus. We read it, when he given thanks, he broke it, he said, Take it, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Let's now give thanks for the one. Loving Heavenly Father, we again draw into thy presence, humbled 
knowing that you are creator, knowing that you know all things, you know the end from the beginning, yet you chose to fill the earth with your glory and you've asked us to be part of that. And we thank you for that promise they've made to us and the way that's been opened unto us through your great love, that sacrifice that you made on our behalf. And today as we take time to think, to reflect, to be reminded of that great sacrifice, we see the wine as a symbol of your son's blood poured out. One who was human, who suffered and who was in agony, giving himself willingly so we may have hope, we may have a promise and we may be part of that glorious kingdom soon to be set up. And we know, dear God, that in that blood, it's a symbol of life and dedication. And we thank you for his example to us. We thank you for that life of commitment that he made to you, where he did not his will, but thine be done. And we know, dear God, there can be no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. And through this emblem, we see a symbol of thy son's blood poured out blood. And we thank you for that great sacrifice. And as we dedicate our lives to you, we ask to God that you give us encouragement, uplift us and build us up as we wait for thy son's return. So be with us, we do pray, accept our thanks, our praises and our petitions now as we ask this prayer through him who we come to remember our Lord Jesus. As we continue this morning, brothers and sisters, our meditation, oh, sorry, our memorial hymn this morning will be hymn 230. Now we have an opportunity to give us, we've been blessed in our collections this morning will be um, the black bag, will be the general for the general fund and the blue bag for our building fund in which I'll invite Brother Jeremy to come up and uh, give us the ecclesial announcements. Thanks Brother Jeremy and on your behalf brethren and sisters I'd like to also thank Brother Mark this morning 
He's uh, given us much to think about. He's encouraged us with three characteristics for our spiritual well-being. The power of exercising the power of God through exercising ourselves in meditation, prayer even, reading, no, no matter what. Also love and discipline of a sound mind. And we have all these things available to us. He reminds us of that through the Holy Spirit. So we'd like to thank him for his words this morning. Let us, brothers and sisters, now conclude with our final hymn, hymn 135. The Lord and Maker of mankind, forgive us, sorry, forgive our foolish ways. come to you now not wearing flying clothes not with any knowledge or intelligence we come here as naked lame beings in the power of Jesus you have created us as special beings with minds that can actually point forward to the divine to know we have seen, tasted, and touched the good news and we've responded and we believe although we believe we we suffer and we live in contradiction we believe that your son has saved us and he will come and restore the earth and restore our bodies but we still behave as though we don't believe 
But we thank you so much that your love has not stopped there, that you have totally loved us and saved us despite the fault, the faulty people that we are. We can see in this earth so evidently that the, those that don't believe are so confused with their own morality, they're confused with their meaning and with their own destiny. And we can see that it causes so much grief and discomfort in their lives that many people will even choose to end it. But because we live in hope and truth, that we have so much to be joyful about and that the gospel message isn't here to scare us but to help us and to help us to live in peace now despite the things that we experience. So with the joy and confidence that you have given us, we, we ask that we might be able to leave our sacks of sin and our bags of fear at your feet that you might be able to fill, fill them with hope and peace, that we can go on and show the world that there is a truth, that there is meaning, and there is morality, and there is a destiny. So we, we constantly ask you to live in us, to be in us, and it's through the power of Jesus that we live and pray. Amen.